All right. Oop. Okay. This will be our last lecture for the semester. I'm sure you're just distraught over that. This one's on virtualization and VLANs. It's pretty short. There is a quiz. There's a lab you can do if your computer's powerful enough. It doesn't take a very powerful computer, but some of you during these dark times may be stuck on just terrible hardware. And some of you have already done it for other classes. If you've already had a class on virtual machines and stuff like that, you're good. So you don't have to do that. Um, but remember, you got to turn everything in. Everything. By May 4th. And then the finals do um, like the 14th. You'll have like four days to do the final if you need to. I will be sending you guys notes. Uh, once you've taken exam three, I can send you a note saying what your final grade is. If it's an A, you don't have to take the final. So get an A, please, for everyone's sake. If you do have to take the final, it's due May 14th. That's because commencement's the 15th, so I have to turn in your grades right away, finals week. Don't make me late on that. They'll be all over me. Uh, okay, so let's talk about virtualization. And if you have any questions on this, as always, email me, but uh, I think you're going to be okay because you many of you have had this in other classes so uh, it'd be helpful to have the PowerPoint on the screen okay virtualization means pretty much just what it says it's emulation of pretending to be a computer simulating an operating system it allows you to run multiple operating systems on one computer you can create a virtual workstation that someone actually works at and does things on you can create a virtual server that provides services over the network to other things and yeah uses a lot of different hardware these days VirtualBox is free for every platform and it lets you run virtual machines and then if you need an operating system to run Linux is also free more on that in a bit this is kinda of what it looks like you have an actual server at the bottom and then you put an operating system on it and you have some hypervisor software like VirtualBox or something that manages virtual computers. And then you have more operating systems, fake ones, essentially. You still have to pay for them, but <clears throat> they run on here and then you run apps within them. If any one of these screws up, it doesn't affect the others. They're virtually three different computers. They don't know they're on one computer together. I liken this to the movie Inception, if you've seen that, although I think this is a terrible analogy because Inception is actually more complicated than virtual machines. But whatever, there is a reality level, and then they go into level one, and this guy is essentially the operating system. Everybody's in his dream, and then on down the line. So if you've seen that movie, virtualization should be pretty simple to you because that movie can be a little confusing. So, go away, Inception. Okay. Now, if you're using it, and you set it to, say, full screen, you might not even know you're on a virtual machine. It's a little slower. There's a bit of a performance hit, but it it can do everything a real computer can do if you let it. And yeah, pretty much covered that. Let's get into this in more detail. This is the book's amazing picture. Like this is a as good a diagram of, of this as I've ever seen because I Googled and I couldn't find a nicer picture than this that explains it better. But you see, this is a supposed to be a real computer with a real NIC, a real Ethernet card, connected to a real network. And then inside it, these machines are not real. They are virtual. Okay? This is what it looks like in like a flow chart. Hardware, hypervisor, software, and then a bunch of other OSs. Okay? This can get a little confusing. It gets a little deep. But let's do an example one here. Okay? An example. Here's our PC. We put Windows 10 on it, we put VirtualBox on it, and then we have our bag of cats. That's really it. Set up a VirtualBox can be a little trickier than that, but it's not too bad. And it is free, so you should, you should definitely be at least minimally acquainted with it. And this is the model of virtual machines compared to a regular computer. Here's your hardware, your operating system, and then your apps. Virtual machine, same thing. Again, we're just getting a little more complex with each one of these designs. So why do we do this? Well, it allows us to kind of max out a machine. Um, it's efficient. We don't pay for extra hardware. We just pay for extra software. So 
This hardware uses less electricity than three computers to run two virtual ones inside a real computer. And fault and thread isolation. If one of your virtual machines goes bonkers, you get a bad Windows patch, you get hacked, you get some other kind of software incompatibility, the others are unaffected. They're all separate machines as far as they know. And you can just back up the VM file. Like instead of backing up an entire, you know, this, these files, documents, pictures, whatever, you back up the VM file. It contains everything. It contains the operating system and all the files inside it. Disadvantages, like I said, it is a little slower because if your machine's running Windows 10 and then it's running Linux inside a virtual machine, it is running two operating systems. And the hypervisor has to juggle that, has to kind of balance that power between them. Of course, it is more complicated. You'll sometimes find yourself going insane when you have multiple VMs. Licensing costs, sure, but still cheaper than more hardware usually. Single point of failure. If the host machine that all of these different imaginary computers are running on has a motherboard failure, they all come crashing down. So that's bad. Okay, VMware is pretty widely used. It's very friendly. There's also parallels. Uh, VMware's product is actually called Fusion, not just VMware, I think. But VMware, you can download like a trial license or a single user license is free. So I encourage you to check that out too. If you're serious about working in VMs, you should definitely be familiar with all the different platforms. In fact, Parallels might even have a trial period you can do. But you should understand the interface of all of them. They all do the same thing, more or less, in different ways and at different levels of uh, helping. Like um, Parallels will hold your hand a little bit, whereas VirtualBox does not so much because it's free. They, didn't, they don't have the resources to jump into it and make it look awesome. But Parallels looks pretty awesome all the time. So... Uh, Microsoft's Hyper-V is built into Windows, so you've got that available. Kernel base, VirtualBox, yeah, yeah, there's a few other choices. I'm not going to go into detail on all of them. Like I said, you guys have better classes than this one for virtual machine stuff. The virtual machine can also create a virtual network, not just a virtual processor and RAM, but it can create a virtual NIC and say, connect your virtual machines together on the host, but not let them outside that area. Okay, so this is where you can really get confused because you have a real computer with a real Ethernet card, then you have three fake Ethernet cards and three fake computers, and they each get a MAC address, an IP address, and et cetera, et cetera. So you can lose yourself. All right. The virtualization software manages all this stuff for you. Most of them have a um, virtual machine creation wizard that you, that you just kind of walk through and follow the instructions. You need an operating system downloaded, and then you need the app. I'll show you in a bit for the lab. Mm -hmm. To get online, you need a virtual adapter. So your Windows 10 machine with VirtualBox and Ubuntu on it, Ubuntu talks to the VirtualBox, and VirtualBox is like, here's your Ethernet card, buddy, and it's not real, but Ubuntu totally can't tell the difference. So it believes that it's talking to a real network interface card. It's really just talking to VirtualBox, which is talking to Windows, which is talking to the real card. Mm -hmm. But they still got to have addresses. They still have to go by the normal rules of the internet to function online. They have to have an address. Okay. This is kind of what this looks like. All of these little VMs here, this Windows, CentOS, and Kali, they're all living on this Ubuntu host, and it's getting online. And they have what's called a bridged connection, this thing forming a bridge between this and them. So that is how they get online. And they get an IP address, and usually you're going to have VirtualBox do NAT. You guys remember NAT, NAT, where it makes up an imaginary internet. So this internet is not real. In every sense of the word, it's not real. So it's got made-up IP addresses. It's got like 10.0.2 and 10. whatever, and the real internet doesn't doesn't know how to you know address those. It knows how it knows this guy's real, so it talks to him, and then he handles it from there. So just remember that that the virtual machine host does NAT, N-A-T. Let's see if we can kind of draw this thing. Yeah, okay, there's your DHCP server handing out real IP addresses. And here's a physical NIC. And then the virtual machine has a virtual switch. And in this case, it is in full bridge mode, meaning it's letting the VMs talk to this DHCP server. It's just letting them online and act like fully normal citizens of the internet. That's what it's doing. So this is like a total total bridge. Uh, bridged mode, it even says at the bottom, if I would read it. All right. NAT mode's where it makes up the imaginary internet. 
Uh, gets a real IP from the host. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We just covered this. Yep. All right. This is what that looks like. Same diagram. The internet's out here. Physical network comes in here. Physical net does its normal job. The virtual machine does NAT and it functions as a DHCP server. So it's like, oh, here, imaginary computer one. I made up an IP address for you. Imaginary computer two. Here you go, bud. You're on the internet. They're not really. I mean, they're connected to it, but they're not on it by themselves. Every one of these programs, VirtualBox and all the others, has a fairly scary-looking preference panel. It can be a little intimidating the first time you ever see it, but you'll get to know your way around it. And here, look, they've set it. This is my VM test one. Don't know what operating system I have on it, but for network, I have said, yeah, I want this VM to be able to use the network adapter. And yeah, I want to make up an imaginary IP for it. It doesn't need a real one. That's just one of the ways you configure this stuff. Okay. Moving on. You use this to test things. If you're not familiar with Ubuntu Linux or Mint or Debian or whatever, you download it, throw it in a virtual machine, and goof around in it for an hour or two. Get to know it. Then later on, when you're trying to troubleshoot it or you're in a job interview and someone says, do you have any experience with Ubuntu? You said, yeah, I've run it in a virtual machine. I've played with it. I lived off of it for a week, whatever. Get yourself some experience and check off those boxes. Okay. All you need is an image of the operating system. I don't know why this picture is there, other than it's a bunch of different. Vir oh, it's yeah. These are prepackaged virtual machines. I remember this. You can download these, and they are virtual machines that work in whatever you want. Like you can download them for VirtualBox, but you're like, hmm, I need a domain controller. I download a virtual machine that is already set up to be one. I need a file server. I download a virtual machine that is already set up to be a file server. And I just start up the virtual machine, configure the server, and there you go. My host operating system has no trace of any of this stuff in it. It just has VirtualBox. So this is where you kind of keep things separated. Your main computer gets hacked or this guy gets hacked. It doesn't affect the other pieces. That's the advantage. So any service you want, you could download a preloaded um, image for it. Pretty handy. Router redundancy protocol. Yeah, Cisco's pretty big on this stuff. We're not going to quiz on it. Virtual IP address can be shared. Yeah, this allows multiple routers to act as one. Again, we're not going to go into too much detail on that. I should have tossed that slide. Okay, you can virtualize network service. You can have a virtual machine that functions as a router, or as we just said, a file server, or some other network controller. Why not? Then you can back it up easier, and if something goes wonky with it, you can easily just wipe it, spin it right back up. Okay. So you build your physical infrastructure, because you still got to connect everything. Then you have your network controller. On that is a bunch of virtual services. You're like, oh, well, let's put a load balancer in there to manage all these different things we've connected. Virtual routers to give people online. Virtual switches. And virtual firewalls to protect us. All of that as virtual machines. Why wouldn't you? A VLAN, similarly, is a virtual LAN. You remember a LAN is like G102, our classroom. Just a bunch of 14 computers and a teacher computer connected up to a switch in the room. Well, a virtual LAN is that, but what if G102 was half the size it was and it was split into two rooms? So you had like seven computers in one, seven in the other. Uh, that would be terrible, but if we did it, we could still VLAN it together as if it's one big room. So you, the network technician, get on and say, G102A and G102B, as far as the network is concerned, are one room. There's no difference. They see the same file shares, they see the same printers, they see the same everything. That's what a VLAN does. Things might not physically be in the same place, but network-wise, they act like they are. Okay, you got to have a little more sophisticated switch for this. Yep, each VLAN has its own subnet of IP addresses, but it can actually mix mix clients together. More on that in a second. Can include ports from more than one switch. So this is since it's a VLAN, it doesn't physically have to be one switch. This is what your network looks like physically. We got a router, then we have these switches. And we're like, okay, you guys up here, you're VLAN 1. 
you guys, your VLAN 2, your VLAN 3, but oh crap, this guy and this guy need to be like together. These two need to be together. That's not the pin. You're like, these are the same network. So what you do is you go in there and um, VLAN them together. So switch A has part of it, and switch B has part of it, and you tell the router, hey bud, I want these to function as if they're one little VLAN. So these are both VLAN too, and the router handles it. It's a little more complicated for the router. But this lets you separate people by groups and security, just like when you're subnetting, but now you're doing it in totally different physical locations. Like subnet, you like take a room and split it into two. This is taking multiple rooms and rejoining them into one thing. So you can isolate connections, you can prioritize certain devices data like, hey, you're on VLAN, you're on the accounting VLAN, you get priority on internet speed. You will never feel the bog in the afternoon. Marketing, those guys are jerks. We just let them suffer. Um, engineering, they're the ones who are setting this up, so undoubtedly they prioritize their traffic pretty high. That's how humans work. They take care of number one. But this lets you separate the network out, even though physically they could be scattered all over the place. If you've looked at the Johnny Logan layout of buildings, you guys have generally Department A is in Building A, Department B is in Building B, but sometimes there's spillover. Sometimes Department B takes up more than Building B, and they spill over into Building C. And they turn to the network guys and they're like, well, we want everybody to see the same shares and printers and stuff. And so the networking goes, okay, we're going to VLAN you guys together, even though you're in physically separate buildings. That's the point. It's handy. Uh, here's a better look at this. It's a really good diagram of how it's supposed to work. So a single physical connection between switches is called a trunk. Port on the switch is considered access or trunk port. Yeah. And the access port, you connect a single person. Trunk port, you're like, uh, we're connecting you to another switch. So when you have two switches hooked up to each other, for example, uh, let me get the laser pointer so it's obvious. But this guy is just, he's accessing the switch. He's just being an access user. He's using the internet. Individual, individual, all of these are the same. This line that goes between the two switches is a trunk line. It connects these two major switches. It has tons of traffic going back and forth, not just one person's. So we call this a trunk port. And usually on a switch, sometimes they'll physically have one devoted to it. It's usually called an uplink port on home switches. And sometimes it's not. Sometimes you have to get into the switch's software and say, oh, port 8 is the trunk port, by the way. So devote lots of resources to that so it's not slow. Okay. So you keep the VLAN data separate. This does add a minuscule amount of overhead in that every packet that flies back and forth said, I'm from VLAN 2. So you add this tiny little bit of overhead. I don't think it's enough to be really measurable. Mm, Cisco, of course, has their own protocol for it because they love that stuff. And we used to use all that stuff, but recently we switched to open source at SIU. Cisco is really good stuff. Reliable, fast, secure. They're I mean, some people say they're the best in the world for this sort of stuff, but they're very expensive. Um, there's open source solutions that will run your router, run your VLAN, set up all your stuff. They're obviously cheap to buy, usually zero dollars, but then you pay a little more in support and training for your staff, but oftentimes it works out. That's kind of the push-pull of open source in general, and it applies to networking software too. VLAN hopping attacks, yeah, there's a bunch of things people do to try to exploit and goof up your VLAN. Don't let them. So we made spanning tree protocol because this, you guys are already familiar with how complicated routers are and how many things they think about on a daily basis, uh, or on an hour, moment to moment basis, but um, we needed something a little more elaborate for, for VLANs and higher level stuff. So this is still in the data link layer. It prevents loops and it actually blocks and eliminates bad loops. Uh, I've got a map for this. Yeah. Let's look at this. So here we are. We want to go from switch C to switch D. And we try to just go to B, but 
Spanning tree has blocked that because it's slow for some reason. Maybe there's too much traffic. Maybe this is bad hardware in this area. It's like, no, it'll actually be quicker if you go this way. And I'm so confident that it'll be quicker if you go that way that I'm just going to eliminate any other route you might take. Too bad. It's pretty firmly in charge, spanning tree. And we have newer versions of it. Shortest path bridging, of course. This is... Uh, this is just how this is managed. And we have Trill. Yeah, that's the newest. And SPB, shortest path bridging, is, is a descendant. Again, we're up to uh, layer three. We're past the data layer now. And it keeps all, yeah, it's a little newer. It doesn't do the just blocking of stuff. It, it manages on the fly, much more dynamic. So you guys know if you take a switch like this right out of the box, what you get is an unmanaged switch anything you connect to it it connects to anything else and let's see do you have an uplink port yeah this look it looks like it's probably ah yeah yeah i guess any one of these can be i forget how these work but this one's just a separate box all right so that's a switch right out of the box turn it on plug in everybody's computer start killing each other in video games very easy but a managed switch allows you to get in a command line interface and run VLANs through it. This is this is not something this little guy can typically do. It doesn't have the power to handle all that work, and it doesn't. Um, it's just not designed for that. Now you get a nicer switch, and you have a lot more options. You have total control over what every port is doing, and you can set up stuff like that. You can say this is the trunk port. This is the such and such. These are a VLAN. Okay, you get a little more oomph out of this. But it's a lot more money okay so you can take your quiz now or you can take it after this because the lab demonstration thing is next i just want to make sure that everyone in here has at least a basic understanding of how you would set up a virtual machine okay so let's do this discard the ink thank you and I don't think I actually saved that okay so we're gonna run uh, Oracle's virtual box text is a little small but you just create new um, let's we'll, we'll call it you bunt bro and memory size oh, one gig of RAM is not enough let's go two gigs of RAM create a virtual hard disk okay these are default settings of VirtualBox, okay? This one's free. Download VirtualBox, install it, and you get this. So we create. And let's see. There we go. We want a installer file. We say go ahead and create that thing. Then we start it. And, oh, I got it will not let me move this over. Here we go. This is what pops up. It's like, hey, do you have some installed media? Do you have a way to install an operating system on here? And I say, yeah, I do. Come over here. And we're going to add a fake CD. And here's Ubuntu. And this takes a second. VirtualBox is taking a look at my... U this is a standard free Ubuntu install ISO. I downloaded this half an hour ago. Okay, and that's our guy. We choose him, and we say start. So it pretends that it has a DVD drive. It pretends that it has this disk in that DVD drive, and it just tries to boot your imaginary computer from the imaginary DVD drive. And it threw it way over here, so let me bring it over. It also made the resolution very small, so it's kind of difficult to read but this is it um, I don't know why we're not seeing it here we go yeah where is it yeah there it is all right so it's checking the disk it's installing well it's not installing it is booting up and Ubuntu does a cool thing that other operating system installers might not let you do Mac OS or Windows, you boot from the install media and then you can either erase the drive or install the operating system or both. But that's it. Ubuntu does a cool thing where it'll actually just 
boot up the operating system. It's going to boot up Ubuntu and let us try it before we install it, which is very cool. It's called a li uh, Linux Live install. And they just built it into their install ISO. Very handy. So when this comes up here in a sec, come on, bro. You can do it. You can see the screen is not full size. This monitor is a 1920 by 1080 and it started Ubuntu in a very small screen size, probably to conserve resources to make it a little peppier. Because even on a powerful computer, this one has 16 gigs of RAM and it's a Ryzen 7, a virtual machine can run a little slowly. There's a lot going on and you run three or four or five virtual machines, starting them up certainly is very slow. Oh, it's beautiful. There we go. Ubuntu has started, and we can install it, or we can try it. I'm just going to say try it, just so you guys can very quickly see what that's like. Install is like, oh, we erase the drive and we install the operating system. Takes probably 20 minutes to half an hour. Um, we got some kind of text error that flew by there real quick. But it doesn't seem too serious so far. We'll see if we can actually get to the desktop with this. There it is. And we have a basic Ubuntu installation here. In fact, if I want to, let's increase the resolution. Um, yeah. Let's just do bigger. Keep the change. Eh. Let's shrink it a little. Apply. Keep it fine. But anyway, this is a virtual machine. It is not real. You see my Windows is still running in the background. See Windows down here. And up here, I have an actual Linux install that I can play with. I can use it, install stuff on it, break it, delete it, recreate it. It's kind of a consequence-free environment, relatively consequence-free. It'd be impossible for bugs and viruses and stuff to get from here to my Windows computer, both because it's over the virtual machine barrier and it's a different operating system. But this will go to the internet. Okay. But there you go. It works. It totally works. Okay. And then if I don't want to mess with this anymore, close the tabs, please. I come over here and I say, let's turn it off. Let's shut down that VM. And uh, power off this imaginary machine, please. Now that it's powered off, I can come over here and I can say remove delete all the files and boom it's gone and VirtualBox just kind of suddenly closes which is very cute but that's basically it and there's much better guides than the one I just fumbled through for how to do this but I just want to make sure that you guys at least have this base level of knowledge of that is how virtual machines are done you need it um, if you haven't taken the virtual machine course that John A. Logan offers it's from what I understand very in-depth very good so I highly recommend it okay it has been lovely to have all of you as students this year I am sorry this virus took kind of half the fun out of this we don't get to like hang out and talk talk trash um, you guys have been really funny and really patient and I appreciate you so take your dang quizzes you get two attempts per quiz up until May 4th and take your exams you can take those up until May 4th and I'll let you know if you have to take the final but I'm going to try to send all of you a note with your breakdown of your final grade as of exam three. And if you want it before that, just email me and I'll, I'll do it. I'll tell you where you're at. But most of you are in good shape. Okay. Have fun. Stay safe. Bye-bye.